starting the stream. Stream activated. Is this Harry Potter? It's on my loaf. It's on this lo-fi covers playlist. <laughs> Wait, a hip hop beat will drop in one sec. Got you. I remember uh, when this movie first came out. And I forget what movie blog it might have been in a cool or something else that I was reading at the time, hmm. but they linked the the score because the score obviously is you know it was on its way to become iconic, but it literally just come out. And I remember listening to it as a you know fresh faced eighteen year old, and I was just like, "This shit slaps! <laughs> this is a really good fucking score." It, 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 we don't get melodies the same way i don't know there's a lot of like very utility based m soundtracking yes well especially for like big score stuff i think that was one of the biggest uh criticisms and i think rightly so of yeah, the marvel cool. movies yeah is that like their their scores were just like like guys come on this is where we're just gonna kill good scores this is where good scores are supposed to exist yeah i mean they did that they did one melody the Avengers one. The Avengers one. Dun, 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 which it's like. I'm glad you did it because I could not remember it. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Which it's like that only gets dragged up because the movies are so iconic. Yeah. It's not like anyone listened to that and were like, was like humming it out of the theater. It's only because they were in the, the, the biggest movies that they're like, oh, that's just the beeping sound that happens after my, after Robert Downey Jr. is iconic. Yeah. Hey, Justin, could you check your email again and see if there's no. an update? Cause I had the right email yep. in here, but okay. Oh, what's going on. All right. I did get that. All right. I reset the password for you there. Got you. Justin at interdimensional.ai. Yep. All right. Never you mind. All right, cool beans. All right, cool beans. I'm logged in. I'm in. I'm into the matrix. <laughs> you can call I'm this the in. matrix because I'm in it and I don't know how to get out. All right, you guys ready to do uh, some weird things? Let's do it. Uh, Andrew, can you uh, can can I hear you count to three for me? Just make sure we got the right audio set up. One, two, three, four. Great. Five. Okay, great. Six. Nope, you're good. That's <laughs> no seven. more numbers. Numbers are done. No, we're done. <laughs> done with the numbers. O Ocho. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fuevos. Okay. Then I'll, uh, I'll catch you in to start the Weird Things program. How about that? Let's go. Cool. All right, take it away, Andrew. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things podcast. I'm Adam Ian, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Oh, hello. Anybody else who might drop in? We'll see. You never yeah. know. No, no, no. You never know. We might get haunted by a ghost. Exactly. Or maybe they're applying to be the new head of UFO research for NASA. Oh, um, is that now? That sounds now. That sounds like a, a is that, Jetsons job. Is, is that, that up? A, is that up on Indeed.com? <laughs> um, all I know is the thing that they're saying it's gonna happen. And I mean, what know. are we? What are we doing here? Like for real, what are we? What are we doing here? Someone's got to identify these flying objects. Well, I, I mean, don't understand what you're what you're because, so spicy because about. Because UFO is in general a military term, right? Like, like, like the, the, at least that's that's the stuff that that we are hearing and, and talking about is is an unidentified flying object. For NASA, I mean, what is is this just an influencer? We're gonna have Jake Paul get clearance. What's happening? So. You know, I, for and, and some of our listeners, maybe who are no longer listening, have been upset with or not happy with our take of like the UAP stuff, where you know the UAP images and stuff. To my eye, 
and I am very open to alien. And I, I, you've watched me here defend the idea that like we can't rule something out just because it may have technology we don't understand. Yeah, but I could kind of be dismissal of like the UAP stuff because having been somebody who's played with imaging systems and artifacts in electronic, you know, uh, vision systems, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's this thing. This is clearly, this is a flare caused by this reflection here or whatever. I haven't seen anything that's persuasive. Um, you know, I've even read like, so like, well, you got to check out this, this research center. These people like, you know, they're the real ones. So I go there and I find their 20 page report on, you know, some UFO thing and not, a sentence about the possibility that the imaging system might have a defect that causes this, which is not a credible or skeptical take on it. And it's hard for me to go, okay, so you never thought to think it's just, you know, a lens flare. It's not yeah. just because we've just. So, and, and not to mention uh, the other dude is telling a story about a story that he heard. So we're not even firsthand information yeah. on, on that stuff. It's like, look, I, I'm, I'm here. Mine's open. I am willing to accept any new information that comes on, but you know, if it's just those two things and people uh, uh, raiding various different uh, burial centers in Mexico that are that are the leading p- bits of evidence for for uh, aliens, then come on, I need more. Yeah, I think yeah. You know, the problem is too is the average person when somebody presents information to us, we either think this person's telling the truth or they're lying to us, and we're not as equipped are adept to the idea that somebody is telling us something they think is true, but is not true. And and that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people feel persuaded because you have some very persuasive people with really credentialed backgrounds, you know, making claims about this. And I get it where you go, well, well, geez, but it's like, and I spent, you know, a good part of my life working for the James Randi Foundation, yeah. going into laboratories and talking to really, really smart scientists, people smarter than me who were falling for the thumb tip trick. You know, who are yes. falling for very basic stuff. And I'm like, well, they're smarter than me and they're falling for this. Then there, there, there was a hope, great why? story that Randy used to tell of uh, going to, and I forget who the person was, but it was going to see David Copperfield with somebody that was extraordinarily smart. Marvin right? Minsky. It's a Marvin Minsky. I was yeah. there. You were there. Yeah. And, and uh, Copperfield is doing his flying routine. And he is, it, it's elegant. And it's amazing. And it's, it's great. And Marvin Minsky He's freaking out, freaking out, because he's like, oh, my God. Have they not thought about the pacemakers? There are people with pacemakers. Their, their hearts could stop they, to have magnets like that what? around these people. What? Like, th- th- this, could, this could cause deaths. This is, this is uh, uh, an atrocity. Th- th- how dangerous, how reckless. And Randy <laughs> has to go, like, hey, it's not. He has to like calm him down by telling him how the trick is done. Which spoiler alert isn't magnets. It's not and, magnets. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, but no. just because he was freaking out, wow. and it's not because he's dumb. he just didn't know. He just, thought wrong. Well, and, and and also it's it's. I think the way that we understand intelligence and just like kind of the raw computational power of our brains and and the people for whom I do think the older I get, just built different. There are some people for whom just have a higher rev processor than other people. Now, that comes with a a blessing and a curse. Number one, if you're pointing it in the right direction, you can rip through a lot of data and come to a lot of conclusions really fast. If it's pointed in the wrong direction (laughs) or you are following a a thread down an incorrect path, then you've got enough processing power to make up the data that will uh, 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 lead you to some some crazy conclusions. Yeah, Yeah. well, I mean, for, for, for whatever reason. And I think... We, we look at that often as, oh, okay, well, that's smart and that's dumb, with the idea being that if you've come to the, co- the correct conclusion, you are smart. If you've come to an incorrect uh, a conclusion, you are wrong. That, to me, is not intelligence, but I think that oftentimes we do assume that it is. Mm-mm. We we see this where there's a series of steps between information coming from wherever it does to you. And we assume we make decisions based upon like, okay, I'm, I'm a good judge of the source. I'm a good judge of the quality. I'm a good judge of this. And if you're wrong about one of those steps or, and because maybe you've been misinformed about it. And I've watched very, very, very smart people get taken in by UAP stuff and be like, well, what about this? Well, this is, you know, explainable. Okay. What about other stuff? Okay. But you started with thinking this thing was real. Yeah. And then clearly was debunked. Shouldn't that tell you, your reasoning for the other ones might be faulty as well. And that's hard. It's a very hard pill. 
and particularly uh, there's some very prominent people who've kind of gone all the way out there to say like, hey, you know, there's something going on here. And it's like, eh, maybe, you know, listen, I believe we're in a simulation and it's possible. <laughs> so. Wouldn't it be very funny that, if it would be very funny if in the future we were, we found out that we are in a simulation because UFO sightings are like at a regular like pace like oh you know every thousand years we get a thousand ufo sightings or something something like really well but here's like, here's <laughs> even if that's the baseline level of proof we're not there <laughs> if we're talking about ufo sightings glimpses pictures maybe a gif of of, 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 I... of a ufo and not aliens not recovered hardware not stuff like that then we're not close can I tell you that, that the pattern is every time there is a new imaging system that people don't understand and we get access to large amounts of images from there. So as you started to have well, most of the UAP stuff is infrared imaging systems coming from like, you know, naval craft, et cetera. We didn't have access 20 years ago, so it wasn't really there. You know, maybe like, you know, go for, you know, uh, Iraq some stuff, but really now the volume of stuff and people are now searching. Now they're looking at these archives of stuff, trying to find stuff. And they're like, and these are complex systems. And we saw this in the 90s with digital cameras yep. and the, the shutter speeds. We'd see orbs. We would see little streaks. We had, There was entire names of phenomenon for stuff. And people were like, oh, I saw a streak in a football game. Or is this? Well, did you see it? No, but my camera captured it. It's like, yeah, that's a that's a, a digital camera or electronic shutter. Like every time there's some new tech that people don't know. And then you go, oh, yeah, that's just this. What's funny is there is there is a billion, over a billion cameras in people's pockets on the planet right now over a billion cameras in people's pockets right now okay and these are now higher quality cameras than ever before because of android and iphone and whatnot where are the effing awesome iphone and android photos of you where are these yeah. they don't exist why because when we do see something we know what's caused you know it's like that's that to me is the most because then we would have it in 4k we'd have it in exactly. 4k where? What is our evidence? Well, it's these really technical cameras we don't understand that use infrared imaging and have these sensor mounts and stuff like this. We don't understand. It's this really like, and it's like, okay, weird conditions where the plane's elevated up there and is very abstract. At the time. This is where it's coming from. Like that should be the most suspicious thing of all. The fact that, you know, there's a billion cameras on the planet and it ain't captured it. It's these camera systems that people, one, some of these instruments are classified and it's like, yeah, but look there. It's like, all right. Okay, well, counterpoint, cool. counterpoint, Andrew. Yeah. Okay, counterpoint. Haters and losers. Haters and losers, <laughs> majorly. Uh, yeah, I mean, th yeah, th we would have something by now. We'd have it in 4K and HDR. We'd have we'd have a sighting of Bigfoot in the Apple Vision 3D Sad Man technology. But we're not talking about Bigfoot, okay? Let's set that aside there. Set so. Sasquatch aside. Apologies, I don't want to conflate the two. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like, we would have... We we would we would see something. We literally have satellites that are pointed at Earth all the time, taking photos of Earth all the time. Like we'd see something. Well, yeah, and and it gets to this, which is I think the crux of this very show, which is should the burden of proof of you desperately wanting aliens to have visited Earth be what we have seen? or what we would like to demand. And it has been the humble, if implicit, ask of this Very Weird Things program to say, your enthusiasm for aliens existing and visiting Earth should not be dimmed by news like this or commentary like this. If anything, it should only be a sign that you care and are excited about this so much that you demand greater evidence because you will know when you see it that this is this is a thing, but this is not a commentary on whether or not it's cool, smart, awesome, or or anything in between to to want this to be true. Because I think we can all say we all want it to be true. Everybody on this show, more or I less. Mean, um, I mean, you know, I have to think through the implications of that, but yeah, I I think <laughs> it, it. I mean, it would be awesome. We know or, it would be. It would. I mean, it would be unique. Know, it would be interesting. Take ourselves. Take ourselves back, you know, 500 years, and we're off the coast of South America looking at this big wooden ship. Oh, cool. They sound fun. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. But now so, we know we uh, can hack them with a Apple IIGS. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. So I think, yeah, I, 
I, I, the curiosity, we did the show, yeah, because we embraced the curiosity of it, but we also feel like, you know, skepticism. So the NASA thing, like, listen, I, I, I have an issue with this because I don't think there's a there there. And I would say that NASA spending is a bit, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, can't can't keep anything under budget and partially be the problems they have dealing with the Senate and stuff. And like, they're like, well, this is what we need now. And it's like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, you, you're having trouble getting craft off the launch pad. And, you know, now you're like, well, let's just bring in a UFO researcher. Uh, well, okay. Here, so uh, how about other accountant? I mean, that's my suggestion. Is, is, is there a world like, I, I don't know. Could this be a good thing? All of the things that we're describing, maybe this UFO research chief, can can make uh you know ob objective findings about these things and and make I it known more is, Bryce, it's a great point but there is that the, the stat, that's out there like like the 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 explanations and stuff is out there they're readily out there people just choose to ignore them and if um, nasa says oh well this is it then it'll be like well that's just nasa trying to debunk it because they're well, keeping the secrets i don't also i'd I mean, like for them the, i'd like for them to focus on putting things into space like that seems like yeah. a core mission thing. I don't know if it needs to extend to UFO research. It I mean, seems to be we adjacent. Need the Library of Congress need a ghost hunter. If well, they do, man, I got a resume. Yeah, everybody. I'll hunt ghosts. You know, got some sage, got some basil, mm -hmm. some thyme. I'll call the corners. Delicious. Oh, I man, I my problem, I guess, with this is that it's happening because. BS sort of stuff has been elevated and people aren't really looking, people are not being critical about it, which is, for, and I see this in people who I like, and, and I've had people email on the show, like, well, what about this? And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, did you look at this? No response. Zero. Well, all I right. So, so, but, so let, let me, yeah. let, 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 let's be fair here because this is the first that I have seen of this headline. This is, is it something that they are calling a UFO research chief? Is it something that they are, you know, because uh, the, 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 the reason that I think, Andrew, you are rightly skeptical is because this has gotten a lot of attention and much in the same way as there was a lot of hay made online that, you know, Gannett newspapers are hi uh, hiring a Taylor Swift specific reporter, uh, things that are very uh, uh, talked about online tend to be a place where more attention and resources will go. UFOs have been talked about a lot. Agree with it, disagree with it, whatever. The traffic is there. The attention is there. So I could equally see, number one, somebody from a federal budget saying that, uh, uh, oh, we need to spend money, or something that is tangential to that or could be translated as that is quoted as it. So, so uh, Bryce, you have pulled up the article. Can you please read? Yeah, this is um, a quote from uh, a channel pair, uh, or a, excuse me, a panel chair uh, from the Simons Foundation. Uh, it is essential to clarify, based on current findings and methodology, that we find no evidence to suggest that UAP are extraterrestrial in origin. Okay, but that, that so so what but what is what is the headline here with as far as NASA goes like like the, it, yeah so I can read that to you if you yeah, want yeah go ahead uh, yeah NASA recently appointed a director of UAP research originally they refused to divulge his identity at the news conference and hope of avoiding threats and harassment they said his face map you know Hamlin let's go through eight hours later NASA said it's Mark uh, McKierney, who previously served as a liaison on the subject of UAP is between the space agency and the Defense Department. Okay, yeah. So, how does that change your feeling? No, I mean, to be to be honest, I I don't know what this person's actual job is. If they are if they are going between NASA and and the DoD, then it could be a lot of different things. There's a lot of different back and forth that that can and should, by the way, happen between DoD and NASA. Um, uh, oh, the defense. Yeah, the defense element of all of this. Well, right? because again, that's that's where a lot of this comes from. Yeah, and. Uh, 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 B because foreign foreign crafts, uh, weather balloons, the the balloon from China, all the hubbub they about have, that. Yeah, well, hey, they have you know intelligence, and and there's there's so. a lot of stuff that that goes in there. And if you're talking about legitimate uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon and stuff like that, then you are talking about things that are recorded or spotted that may or may not 
you know, uh, uh, be from other countries, China, Russia, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like, so. And, yeah. I mean, if you're, if the job, the goal of the job is to be a liaison between the defense department, NASA, and to be able to say, hey, was this, this, was this, that? Okay, cool. I have no problem. I have no, and, and, and I might be buying into the media headlines for that, but, um, but that, that, that's, it, it does feel like, Director of UAP research does feel like a little bit. Too that's much. yes. That, and, and that's where I, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know where in the media hype cycle slash, you know, ever expanding bureaucracy this lands, but, uh, yeah, it certainly has but a very popular, right a very popular candy coated shell, a mm. UAP candy coated shell around it. Mm. Hey, so we get the, the rainbow. library of Congress ghost hunter. We need the FCC uh, on staff telepath. Yep. Um, start thinking about each agency, what we need. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the uh, 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 Coast Guard uh, Bermuda Triangle tester. That's right. We need yeah. the uh, the army. The army's got to go to the forest and find Bigfoot and bring him Goblin home. Hunters. Got, yeah, and and goblin, the goblins, goblin hunters, yeah. yeah. Work with work with pet control on that one. Just yeah. bring them home. We need. Uh, yeah, I, I, we're all we're all into like inquiry. And make that very clear. We're all into this, but mm -hmm. like, I'm just like, do we do we you know does the, you know, do we need somebody investigating Harry Potter magic? You know, at you like know the National Science Foundation. Here's here's what we do need, friends. What do we, we need? need to investigate your support of this show? Oh, Patreon.com slash weird things. If you head on over to patreon.com slash weird things, you can support this program. And and boy, you want to know what? We love each and every one of you that does it. And and we know that there's a bunch of you guys who have been doing this for, for quite a long time. And I would like to take this moment to say thank you. If it weren't for your support, we would no longer be talking about any of this. Or anything that we're going to talk about going forward. Mm -hmm. It's up to you, friends. Thank you. Patreon.com slash weird things. Gentlemen, I I stand corrected because I'm just reading the headlines now. And I, man, they're egg on my face. What happened? Um, I don't know. What happened? Oh, How embarrassing. embarrassing. What happened? Um, you know, you get in this for a while, you become pretty cynical and it just seeps in into everything. And then when you're presented with really strong evidence, you just dismiss it out of hand mm -hmm. a little jaded I'm just seeing the reports in yeah i'm seeing the reports in from mexico and well there's the proof i've been looking for okay no you want to know what Ugh, this got me so frustrated can you i i only saw the headline on this can you what it what what happened so the what is this? mexican senate or house uh uh there Acosta. was something but it I think it was more of a surprise, you know, people showed we got this, and it wasn't like a formal... It, this was not a... a yeah. Mm. So there was the revelation of what was claimed to be alien bodies in Mexico. Uh, it sure looks like a mummified corpse to me, but there we go. Made out of paper mache. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a toy. That's not an alien. Look at that! That's a toy. That's a toy. I, well, I'm gonna that's I'm gonna bring up my defense of this. Let me let me defend this, okay? Go please. ahead. Yeah, there's some claims of paper mache and stuff. I've seen Mexican paper mache, and it is way more sophisticated and high quality than this. So, must be real. This one snuck across the border. It even looks like ET. They even like made the face look like yeah. ET a little bit. <laughs> this is. This is so I mean, you can almost see the cardboard tubes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the popsicle sticks are right there. I do like that they put them in, like, satin-sheeted uh, 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 caskets. box caskets, yeah. right? They, they really sold it like that. This is like when you buy a new computer and they put all of that foam. Oh, jeez. I, I, you want to know what? I only saw passing pictures online. The, this is moving video that we are watching here now, and they're, like, zooming in on it. It is truly... Uh, initially, when I saw the picture, it looked more in my head like a corpse. Uh, but I... I and and, and I, I was kind of more off-put by it because I was reading it as, oh, they just took a corpse and are, are, are doing it uh, and, and parading it around. Right. But no, the more I see the video here... It is. It's just paper mache. They just made a little art project and they brought it out and, and it's made international news. It's like two feet tall. <laughs> it looks And he's got little hip bones and everything. Like he, he looks like a Pikmin. 
<laughs> this is. Did we? So I feel like I killed about five hundred of these in Zelda. <laughs> Just, no, go back, go back. No, no, that 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 picture of the hands. The hands are the thing that got me because, mm. like, it just is. It has like one tiny finger and then oh, two no. longer fingers. Mm. This is. So, who found? Do we know who found these people or, or, or these aliens? Well, there was. Hey, I mean, there was a, a a a researcher. There was, I guess, there was like a the conversation included. Uh, Ryan Graves is one of the people out there talking about UAPs. He was very embarrassed by this, by the way. He's like, "Hey, this is just ridiculous." It's like, yeah, you don't say. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah. Uh, why, the, the wired headline: No, this is not an alien, and here's why. <laughs> These were, yeah, non-human beings. Believed to be a muddle of human and animal bones held together with glue and fake skin. It was paper mache! You were right. Oh, oh, that's, that's, that's cruel. Yeah. Honestly, it's just cruel. You know, you have to go through a lot of work to make something like this, and you know you are fooling people, and you are you well, know you're spreading just sick. Yeah, that's just, I mean that's just grotesque. Like, like so I'll, I'll, I'll just gonna... say that in 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 all but an extraordinarily well directed A twenty four indie movie, are you the good guy in the story when you're gluing animal and human bones together with paper mache? <laughs> I want to introduce this sort of a, a this this relates to something. So. Uh, Justin and I have a friend, uh, one of our teachers who we respect highly, who was very much into a lot of like alternative history theories and stuff and did like an amazing, compelling slideshow and would show you slides of stuff of like, you know, you know, uh, carvings of dinosaurs in South America and all this sort of stuff. And you're like, you know, you're 14 years old. Like, oh, that looks good to me, you know? And then, you know, as you get older, like I realized, oh yeah, a lot of that stuff we know are fakes because there's an entire market for fakes. And you have this entire, you have this thing here, like, there was somebody somewhere decided it was worthwhile to make these fake aliens. And so, you know, did somebody somewhere decide to carve a fake stegosaurus, you know, out of some plaster and sell it off to a tourist as a, you know, thousand-year-old artifact and stuff? Like, when you put it like that, yeah. almost certainly. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it was one of these things, like, yeah, like, uh, it's interesting when you look through the history of uh, the the crusades and how a lot of that was financed through fakes and stuff. And like, Oh, we found St. So-and-so's finger bone and we found this and whatnot. And our, our, our willingness to be deceived. And it's not like, it doesn't always have to be a profit motive. You know, a lot of times, why do you buy an artifact, like an ancient relic? We think is an ancient relic. Cause you, you want to be in contact with something special. You want to be in contact with something, you know, the gods or whatever. And so just our capacity of things has just been historic. I, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who was involved in one of these projects where they're trying to figure out what kind of markings to do on nuclear waste sites because, you know, they want to keep people from like, yeah. going in there. Yeah. And, right. and I brought up my point like, yeah, the best marking is no marking. You don't mark it at all. You bury it very deeply. You just put some boulders on top of it and you leave it alone because there is nothing you can do. Hmm. Doesn't matter. Like nothing you can tell people that will keep them from digging it up if they think something's interesting there. And the more you tell them how dangerous it is, like we did Egyptian tombs and other places, yeah. like, this is cursed, this is this. You know, we build oil wells in, you know, Indian burial grounds because there's oil there. You think there's something there. And it just, it's like, yeah, it's a fun exercise to think, are you going to talk to people 10,000 years from now? Uh, but we're always going to be digging stuff up because we're just curious. We're yeah, just curious the what's best, there. Yeah. The, the best thing that we can do Let's forget about is, it. yeah, pray that more interesting things happen and it, it is it is lost in the shuffle. Well, and for nuclear waste, yeah. you know, it takes so long to, to decay where that could be in – that could be like it could be dangerous. I mean, it is. I mean, not to say that it's not a not a problem, but it it's it is a fascinating problem because you can't. Yeah, but we're we're hoping that Geiger counters get better, and they're eventually just on the new iPhone. And and so if somebody kicks over the rock, and they're like, oh, man, I I just got a radiation detection alert on my Apple uh, uh, contact lens, and so maybe I should just roll that old boulder back there and move on. Mm. What if it's well, they, not human? They're thinking like. 10,000 years from now, I think 10,000 years from now or whatever, like what happens to civilization collapse and comes up again or whatever. And their idea is how do you talk to somebody in the far future who may have less technology than us and say, well, number one is don't mark it. Don't well, put a big thing there and say, hey, 
I mean, also, it's like that even that thought experiment is we're going to have bigger problems if society collapses and then reemerges. Yeah. Like there's just there's got to be more things going on than whether or not we figured out like a, a poop emoji or a gigantic X is better for stay away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm on team and I think emotions. the best answer is the one that people don't like. Because, yeah, you just bury it and hide the fact that it was ever hidden there. Yeah. You, know? you put up a couple signs that'll last maybe a thousand years or so to say, like, hey, yeah, this is nuclear waste and within the lifespan of the English alphabet. But once those go away, then fine. You know, by the time they get to excavation. It is what it is. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. We should write, maybe we, we should write a book or documentary about it. We should we should record we should record okay here's what we do we record the process of putting all of that junk down there in the earth, and then play that on a on a real time loop above the site so they always see hey we put something down here yeah and you can see that you know we're yeah. being dangerous we're being careful. Uh, oh wait wait Bryce start out to you I think we have a representative for the Peruvian alien that was just uncovered in Mexico. Hello hi. I, I'm a little bit late. Uh, boy, the traffic around Mercury. Am I right? Oh, wow. So you're, sure. you're, you're, uh, you're from outer space. <laughs> well, I, I heard the word alien, and yeah. so that's... Well, of that's course, why, the yeah. big, big international news as the bodies of yep. two aliens were shown yep. in Mexico. Uh, those, those, those are my friends. Oh, what uh, were their names? T Teddy and Edgar. Oh, uh, they, that's that's very nice. They they were a lovely couple. They oh, uh, really. Tragic. Uh, when did they pass? Well, uh, you know, we measure time differently. Oh, this is in, great in space. Um, this is like arrival. Wow, this it, is like breaking news. Like, like mountain time. <laughs> well, it, it's uh, we 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 measure time in geological eras. So yeah. uh, they died. 20 minutes ago. Oh wow. Why do their uh why do why do their skin look like paper mache? Well, uh that is a practice of our religion. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. So they were wrapped in paper mache after dying. No, what we do is we genetically modify our skins so that shortly after we die, mm -hmm. it becomes looking like paper mache because to be honest, a lot of people don't know this about aliens. We're a bit shy. A little bit shy. We don't want really? anybody confirming that we exist or existed. Mm -hmm. So thanks when, again for being when, on our international podcast, by the way. Uh, when 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 we die, yeah, we turn into paper, paper mache. mache. Ah. Uh, some people use us. They fill our mouths with candy. And oh wow! We, we use their bodies so at birthday parties. Aliens were the original pinatas. Uh, well, I, I you know. I, I don't want to say cultural appropriation, but that would be one oh, way to put it. Oh, so you uh, say they, they, they ripped you off. Other, and other you get people, like current events out there, too. Huh? Other people believe yeah. there are sects my, in my, our... My culture is not your costume. Uh, ...our universe that uh, believe that there's no higher pur purpose than to have your body used as kindling for uh, uh, an outing where people smoke pot and, and eat mushrooms. So uh, as a result... That's also an alien thing? Well, I mean, uh, where do you think they came up with the ideas for all those posters? Jeff? Yeah, I mean, did, did you think you guys invented that? That's, did you guys also invent <laughs> invent crushed velvet posters? <laughs> and black uh, light. Okay, well, not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, uh, l let me just say that maybe there's a reason you guys have an Elvis, uh, and it's because oh. we wanted you to eventually be able to have crushed velvet black velvet Damn. Elvis pen you've been guiding us this entire time I, I well technically I'm not supposed to admit to that yeah but, but who who would who would be mad at you uh well I mean what you think you think there were only three of us it was just Teddy no, Edgar, and me I assume I mean, there's more no, but there's it sounds whole, like there's, there's a bit the, of a bureaucracy no here. there's a whole civilization you think that that it's like accidental that that we're messing with you guys? No, no, no. I I'm I'm on I'm on the, the, the side. I, I just want to know where you are. Are you uh, a janitor? Okay. Are you the president? Like, how's uh, your career going? Okay, so look, uh, there's no direct English translation for the name of the program that is the most popular alien program ever. But the closest that I can come up with is Jackass. Okay, it's the number one program. Among all aliens. And you're the star? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. Actually, you humans 
are the stars. We're the stars. Yeah. So we're popular. We're, we're just sort of alien messing world. with There you. must be a language translation because that would imply that like we're the subject of like belittlement or you're making fun of us or. Oh yeah, no, that's that's the whole bit. I mean, it's hilarious. I mean, if you if you humans knew how you looked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I'm, I, I'm on i'm on board with this, this is so great. <laughs> if that was the actual thing that alien said is we've been watching you guys and we have been dying laughing like i'd be like you want to know what i'm like hopefully you guys have guns against other aliens because <laughs> we ain't never going away <laughs> you, you, you look space money is a real thing you think that we're sending all these these flying saucers down just uh, to entertain ourselves no the, there's nothing thing to study about you people they're just they're just running gun crews yeah. yes it's it's the first act of a of, of, of a 17 act structure that we have god you love to see it uh brian did you see the the the, the, the corpses i did uh what was uh, your reaction they look a little bit like paper <laughs> shame on me <laughs> <laughs> I like the face on this one. He's 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 wincing at a joke that Justin and I just made. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Also, maybe doing like an inappropriate racial impression. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what race is that? No, no, stop it. <laughs> you want to know what? Stop it. The no, we're stop it. I think we all know. We're gonna stop it right there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I, I want to change the topic to something else that's ridiculous. Please no. do. <laughs> remember, uh, remember when uh, they decided that, like, in order to get Sudafed, you know, you had to show your ID and you know, yes. like, sign off a thing and all that. And because um, of the chemicals, strange. there's chemicals in it. Well, and and the problem, yeah. of course, is that uh, not everybody deserves equal um, uh, uh, equal treatment for allergies. There, there was a period in my 20s where I was very, very allergic and I was constantly on Sudafed and I had to be smart about rotating the Walgreens and CVSs that I went to because you could only sign out real Sudafed twice in a month. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I would burn various different ones because I had to show my ID and they'd be like, oh, you've already bought two cases. Oh, wow. Do, do, do you guys I, remember I the would... advertisement where they're all like, uh, I forget which astronaut. It might have been Buzz Aldrin where he's all like, uh, uh, ain't no gravity in space. You need real allergy relief. Sudafed. <laughs> and it was like, it was like oh. you couldn't drain in space and that's why you uh, needed to buy Sudafed uh, is because that's what the I astronauts said, I... used. I, I, before, because they had, they switched, there was the stuff you could buy without having to share your ID and all that, and there was no limit on it. And there was like a year or two where I was using that. And that was when I call it my year of sinus infections. I kept getting sinus infections yeah. because I couldn't drain. Because like, yeah, I got bad allergies, lived in Florida, and it just would continuously get these sinus infections. I'm like, I don't know what's doing. Finally, I looked up like, what is this stuff? And I went online, I'm like, I found out that the, that, that the replacement medication they put in there, uh, Phenylephrine, I could, I was, there was only one study in like 1972 that it said it had any sort of utility and it was, was like applied like topically or directly. There was no data whatsoever to it was show a sugar that this was useful. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I got sinus infections because of this. Like I was like laid up because of this, because I couldn't drain because I thought this stuff was, and I used to sort of joke, you know, like, like, yeah, this is, this is a joke. Well, good news, guys. The FDA 16-member advisory panel finally voted yesterday that the, the, it is a useless, it's no better than placebo for treating congestion. This thing has been on the market for 20-plus years. Wow. And it was the FDA that made this decision where they put the other stuff behind there. Wow. And I went through watching this whole dark side of the ring thing about the wrestling trials, like when they went after the WWE for, like, steroids and stuff. And it's like, ah, oh, FDA is here to protect people. I'm like, where were you when I was getting sinus infections because you thought I was going to make meth? Well, you know, and that with, was and that's 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 been the thing is you know for for people who have traveled to Europe, there's always been this thing of like, oh, you got to get British decongestants or like European decongestants because the, the, those are the ones that actually work. Turns out, I, I always thought that they were just better or they had like a higher percentage of it. No. Ours just literally didn't work. We well, went 20 yeah. years eating sugar pills and wondering why I'm still uh, draining. Even worse, the FDA was fighting a two-front war. Not only were they presenting a placebo as an actual Sudafed, 
uh, pseudofed being short for pseudoephedrine, yeah. but they also in the 90s fought the battle against actual ephedrine, like uh, the thing that was that the pill was supposed to fake. And yeah. uh, it's like, uh, 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 do you work for for big pollen? Wait, what's going on? Yeah, right. What? what, what? This mother nature's it, this mother nature's lobbyist is <laughs> on point. To say who who else might have an interest in making that economy big redwood, big sequoia, big yeah, like just the effort that I had to go through to like you know to, they, they put you through to do that was just frustrating. And it's like who are you protecting? Like oh, people might turn into meth. I don't care. And by the way, we sure stopped that. Yeah, you know, right. Like, oh, well, you know. Oh, we have a thing called fentanyl. Oh, yeah, amazing, amazing. How you restrict one thing, the next thing it comes along is even more potent, more addictive, and harder to stop. Yeah, and it's like almost like there's some sort of pressure, some sort of economic incentive, some some, some form of in hand that you can't quite see yeah. that is affecting <laughs> things. An opaque paw of <laughs> sorts. An opaque <laughs> paw pushing over the trees. <laughs> So I, I I talked to one of my one of my old school libertarian friends as a writer. I won't name him here. You probably wouldn't care if I said this because I, I said like I want to hear your point of view though on this. I'm like, what would you do about like? Because I my argument is like, problem is is like we 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 when we I'm, I'm I'm very much do whatever the hell you want kind of person, but I am like I do see like in and even policies it makes it worse. And and you know I said what would you do? And he's like, well you just legalize really good cocaine. <laughs> You know, and everybody will just use that. Well, like, and um, uh, I don't, not, I don't want to dive too deep into it, but uh, we, we've talked on a few podcasts about how late later in my life I got diagnosed with what I thought, you know, eye-rollingly was an ADD diagnosis. And I'm like, whatever, I'll take your low-grade cocaine. But uh, the meds that I'm on are quite effective. Um, and... Uh, I don't know. I think there actually might be something to that where it's like there's some amount of to function at a high level in today's society. Uh, I, I, at least for me, uh, 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 there's no denying that I take amphetamines every single day. <laughs> and it seems to keep me in a healthy relationship with my family, with my business partners and on, a, on these programs. So it, it, it's 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 a confusing uh, af af you know, after a lifetime of hearing warnings about this kind of stuff to just be all like, nope, this seems to work. Uh, I, I, it, it's weird. I mean, the idea is that, you know, you're working with a doctor to get your dosage in a, you know, it's not like you're being let loose on the open wilds of, of, yeah. of pills, uh, you know, like you're working with presumably in a, a professional who presumably has your interests in mind. And, and who notices if you're, you know, g going through all of a bottle in a day or whatever, you know? Yeah. 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 You know, doctors, professionals, your friend's cousin at a bachelor party, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato, yeah, I mean, the, the trusted people, the trusted people in our world. I, I, I will say this, the, the, uh, number of people who I've met who have had experience with cocaine, who, when by profession, the highest percentage of profession, lawyers are pretty high, the highest profession that I've known that people who did this a lot during the period of life, doctors. Yes, because oh, yeah. because That's they're all convinced that they know what they're doing. Uh, and and, but, and uh, lawyers Who's are going to doctor that, the doctors. Well, lawyers are convinced that they know the ramifications of on the negative side. And of legally, and doctors are convinced that they know that they're managing things correctly. I, I, I have encountered the same thing, Andrew. I would say uh, yeah. people in advertising and people who live in New York or Miami, <laughs> those, that's the highest yeah. percentage of cocaine users are people who live in New York and Miami. Well, LA, too, like that was the thing, like, yeah. you know, going from, you know, parties in Florida, like, I smell somebody smoking weed somewhere and into an LA party and walking into a room. And like, it was just normal. It was just normal. And yeah. I'm like, how, like, no, no, no shame. No going to the bathroom and do it. Just people doing it. Like, this is not my scene. You know, like, I think, like, I think you I were also you're hanging out with in the corner. You were hanging out with richer people too. <laughs> it's true. Oh, that's true. Uh, and then there was, uh, uh, a famous magician of which I will not name, who we all love and know, and no big, big surprise there, who uh, could literally do meth in front of you, and he never realized it. That yep. Was... Yeah. 
Yeah. That was Eric the Bath Salt Amazing. Sniffer. Amazing. And not James Randy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, let's go on to picks. Um, g- give me up. a second on my pick. Uh, well, you okay. know what? I'll, I'll, actually, I'll do my pick first. Um, okay, uh, pick it up. Baldur's Gate 3 is really good, y'all. Um, it, it brought me back to everything I loved about the original Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 tactical combat games. Uh, it switches from kind of a, a Diablo-esque running around and anything you can imagine you would do if you were actually playing Dungeons & Dragons, you could try to pull off. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it's like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to shoot an arrow at the top of the chandelier and it's going to fall and, and damage these people. Or you can take your acid arrow and not actually shoot it at the enemy, but instead set a trap by shooting it in front of them so that, and then trick them into walking into it. Or you could split up and say, I'm going to use my charisma to engage somebody in a conversation while the other guy just robs the store blind. All of that is on the table. Um, and then when it comes to combat combat, it does that traditional turn-based strategy thing. Um, and, oh, is it neat. It's, it's a really gorgeous game. Uh, if, if you love D&D and you've ever wondered what it would look like if a game was as good as D&D, yeah. I, th- I think you may have found it. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is very, very good. And this game has been in development for... Ever for Ever. a while, right? And, and, like, and, it was it was a very very long development time. It has come out fully baked, which is not always what happens, especially with AAA games. But it was uh, in early access for a few years. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I think that 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 shows it. It you know because everybody that I've talked to is obsessed with the game, and it looks ten out of ten, especially considering how versatile it is. Well, and uh, there there was a bit of a controversy because uh, the previous two Baldur Gates, uh, Baldur's Gates were from Bioware. This one is the first one by uh, oh, it starts with an L. Larian. Uh, Larian. Uh, uh, it was so, made so, other fantastic t- tabletop RPG games like the Divinity games and all. Right. So, but but certainly there's a bit of a stigma when a new uh, studio inherits a property and uh, they they have acquitted themselves quite well. Knocked it out of the park. Yeah. In my experience from the first, I don't know, three hours of what I'm told is 160 hours of gameplay. Yeah. That's a lot of hooch. Okay. Uh, I like the band Tenacious D. Okay. I do too. And on Audible, they have a series. I think this is in their, I think it's a podcast. So I think you could, if you just have the Audible app, you don't even necessarily have to be it, it, subscribed. I, I think I thought I was going to have to spend a credit. When and you I did told not. Me. Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden it was just playing. And like, it's uh, the first thing I'm listening to is about an hour and a half long. So yeah. And that's, that's all it is. It, 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 it's an hour and a half episode uh, of their series, words and music, which is uh, artists telling their story, uh, but with original uh, performances and a lot of archival audio. Uh, it's called the road to redemption. And it's exceptional, especially if you're a Tenacious D fan. And uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I just didn't know. I, I'd always kind of heard about the origins of Tenacious D, that they played this Largo show that was like a real hotbed for alternative comedy at the time. But this goes into a, a really a lot of the the initial connections that they made that I just sort of thought, you know, especially when I was, you know, in my late teens, obsessed with Tenacious D that it's just, Oh, well they're the D they're gigantic. Like, of course they're friends with all these famous people and they are talking about like, yeah, we played, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this one show and, and Dave Grohl's there. They have audio from that show. I think that was whiskey. A go, yeah. Yeah. They're playing whiskey, a go, go on the sunset strip, uh, uh, how they ran into, um, all the people that they eventually cast in Pick of Destiny, how they, how sad they were about Pick of Destiny not doing as well as it as it could have, uh, the fact that the recurring Sasquatch character through not only their live shows but also their television show was inspired by uh, uh, John C. Riley, who was a fan of theirs from the very very beginning, just saying that he would go run around dressed as Sasquatch in Silver Lake, uh, Los Angeles, back in the late 80s, early 90s. 
which is just an amazing uh, moment, you know, in history. Uh, also, a bold thing to do, knowing that everybody wants to bag a Sasquatch. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so it's great. The production's fantastic. Really, 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 really good. And if you're a Tenacious D fan, it is a must listen. There you go. Uh, the road, road to redemption. Redemption. Yeah. I don't know what that means yet, nor do I know if I ever will. But uh, uh, it's it's great. It's an hour and a half, and it does. Uh, I, I've only made it maybe twenty minutes in, but uh, boy, does it reek of honest and genuine friendliness between the two of them. You know, like I I don't think KG even speaks for the first twenty minutes, which I, you you get the sense is their relationship. Yeah, like there's a lot of <laughs> Jack talking and a lot of KG just kind of going, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Go get it. Uh, I've got a pick here. Uh, I think I've talked about this on Cord Killers recently, but uh, I've been watching this a lot because they put it on YouTube and it's very easy to watch. But I've been making my way through uh, the uh, well, the multinational show, the English show Taskmaster. Um, it's a panel show where they go and record a bunch of comedians being given little challenges and games inside of this studio house area uh and then so they go and film all of these segments and each season it's always the same five contestants so every week they're it's the same people getting you know points and in, in playing along uh but then also they watch back how everyone else did uh it's been you know a few months since they actually shoot it to when they we actually watch the the clip so it's a lot of a lot of fun the comedians are good um and it's been on for for a good long while um, uh, but despite that, they make it pretty easy to watch on YouTube. Uh, YouTube just, <laughs> they've got clips and compilations and a lot of full episodes. So, uh, in terms of like, free, free to watch, uh, big one. What it's always fun. And, and I get why it's your pick second week in a row, Bryce. I think you really, was it my pick last so. week too? I no, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> How's it feel, Bryce? Yeah. How's it feel to not remember yeah. what you said last week? I've been watching it a lot. It's yeah. good. Oh, no, I picked Finity last week. I know, week. I know. Oh, no, I did I pick think- Taskmaster last week. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think about how many shows you got. You do. It's fine. I, I think, I think it, well, singling, I think it's great. I think about how many shows you do where we do fall into, you know, Groundhog Day. I think, yeah. I, think, I, think, I, think I think I picked Hearthstone for six months. <laughs> so don't worry. You're nowhere near the record. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I, I will bring up picks I've had before. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the pick again. Do it. Uh, pick it. One thing led to another where it started off with the curiosity about like the Superboy TV series that was shot in like, you know, the like the early, late 80s, early 90s in Orlando, which was the, the whole history of the Orlando film production in that time period, I think could make for an interesting documentary, um, probably more watchable than most of the shows that were produced there during that time period. But, um, you know, you had Superboy, you had uh, Future Force or Strike Force, something you had. Remember, uh Hulk Hogan show Thunder in Paradise, yep. you know, where they would use like the Disney, like uh, Epcot parts for different going to different countries and stuff. But anyhow, I got in, started, went back to go watch the original Superman movies because I went and watched a bunch of different making ends of those. And one, you just realized that what, what a fine Christopher Reeves was. Christopher Reeves' performance of Superman, it is one of these things where, uh, Everybody to come after. I think some people have done some really neat things and have done some cool stuff for the role, but you just watch him in that and you feel like that is Superman and he's an amazing guy. Wait, wait, and we're, and we're, we're talking like, about the, the Richard Donner uh, first two movies that were shot at the same time, right? Well, remember, it was Richard Donner the first one, then Richard Lester reshot the second one, so he got credit for part two. Got it. It's a complicated production history because Donner did not get along with the Selkins, with the, the rights holders of that. And so Lester reshot part two, did enough to get credit in there. But and you could tell there's some tonal differences. But there is some great, there is some great humor. Like you remember, like Perry White was played by Jackie Cooper, one of the former Little Rascals, and his Perry White was just great. And just the pace when you go to the Daily Planet and the first one starts off with Jimmy Olsen using the camera, looking through the camera viewfinders that moves around. You get Lois Lane asking, like, you know, how many how many T's in bloodletting. You know, and this thing, and then she brings her, you know, her her article to parody is like, there's one P in rapist, and you just realize the kind of stuff that she's reporting on. It's just great, subtle stuff. But in two, there was, I laughed out loud because there's a joke that I've heard a thousand times. It was just funny because, you know, in the part two, it opens up in the Daily Planet, and 
Perry White tells Clark that uh, uh, that the Eiffel Tower has you know has been taken over by terrorists, and and Clark goes, "That's terrible." And Perry White goes, "Yeah, that's why they're called terrorists." <laughs> just just a lot of beats like that, and you look at how like. It's not just Chris Marie's performance of Clark Kent is so great. It's just literally everybody around him, like, yeah, Clark's this kind of klutzy guy from the farm. And just the, you know, like he's a little bit naive. He's this. And it just, he just, you look at some of the other movies and you realize, like, man, like they don't really get that dynamic. And, you know, some of them, it's just literally the difference between Superman and Clark Kent is just the glasses. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, anyhow, but. Uh, well, and and uh, what, 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 one of my favorite little nuggets on the production of that was that um, uh, they changed the part of his hair when he was Superman versus Clark Kent. Yeah. Is traditionally, if you want to portray a villain, you you part the hair uh, uh, from the person's right side to the left, whereas the hero you part from the left side to the right uh, to because you want your heroes to be essentially coded as right-handed, whereas your sinister weirdos are left-handed. Uh, and uh, uh, so many subtle things. And I love Perry White being kind of a proto J.J. Jameson uh, before it became a total cartoon uh, in, in the Spider-Man yeah. movies. Um, so good. That that era is so amazing. Yeah. And, you know, Gene Hackman's Lex Luthor, like the comedy beats in there and his... his you know, and having Ned Beatty is sort of the foil, but like the beats they go, I'm like, this is really, yeah. The lot of people worked on a script, you know, like Mar Mario Puzo worked on it. Other people worked on it. It was like, it was hard to know who really wrote which piece or whatever, but like the comedic bits in there were like, I've heard there was a massive rewrite of Puzo's version, but I don't know. But anyhow, some of the comedic bits, I go, this is, this timing is just, well, you and, know, and I, it's, it's so interesting to see, where the tenor of comic book movies have gone because you're right you watch those donner move the, the the donner films and the way that they've been interpreted is kind of like by the iconography and you obviously see that in in the singer superman movie that came out that was like all about the flash of of and and the kind of memory the halo of the donner movies and not any of the things that actually this made is, them uh, fun. superman returns superman returns yeah. uh yeah. uh and, but like when you look at it, it's like, oh yeah, you know, this was a fun movie. You laughed a bunch, and and it's like, hey, uh, what is the most popular franchise of superhero movies? The Marvel ones. Guess what happens in every Marvel movie? A bunch of laughs, at least the good ones. Like like the characters you want to spend time with. You you are you are put into a world that is exciting and new. Uh, uh, that's shocking. Like look, uh, uh, they, they they were doing it in the Donner movies. Yeah, I, I, it, and, th th there's even the subtext of like they sell the fact that uh, Superman is a very good boy, because if you had X-ray vision, what would you want to do? You would want to look under that dress. What does Superman want to do? He wants to look at her lungs to make sure she's healthy enough while she's smoking. It's uh, it's it's really remarkable. Then, then she asked him to look under the dress. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, what's in front of the lungs? Uh oh. What, what color is my underwear? <laughs> you know, and it is. Uh, yeah, it, it's. I I think that movie. If you go back, I'm like, yeah, I think it hit. It's interesting too. Like, it's almost like an like 45 minutes, 50 minutes. I think before actually Superman shows up, it is a really long build up. But I would say it's actually a pretty interesting compared to other movies and. The Singer movie, I had, I liked the fact that he decided his movie was basically going to be Superman three, as if you know the the Superman three didn't happen. He he treated his or four as Superman three. Yeah. What? Yeah, I mean, just yeah, just just starting it right. Chuck, after Chuck the timeline, yeah. Yeah, and the and then bringing in getting the, the the Marlon Brando footage, the score, and all that, but then it. You know, every every bad Brian Singer instinct sort of took over and stuff. And I remember, like, Superman Returns was just how not fun. Just not fun. No, it's boring. And, yeah, I don't know. We can go into a whole – there's a lot of – yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that's, that's how that's you really feel. I well, I mean, like <laughs> from 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 the director to the casting, there's there's a lot that hasn't aged well about Superman Returns. There's. There is also some stuff online you can find out some behind the scenes stuff more about the Nick Cage Tim Burton Man of Steel, which uh, our Superman Reborn or Superman Lives whatever that was going to be, which that that 
would have been just nuts, insane. Um, because it was basically like you had every bad idea, every idea, everything thrown in there, plus Nick Cage is Superman, which yeah. part of me wants to see it. Part of me is like, oh, maybe good we didn't. Yeah, the uh, Kevin Smith script, uh, the Tim Burton direction. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, at Smith, where John Peters kept coming in and like, yeah, Kevin Smith Giant Spider. This work. Yeah, well, John Peters says, you know, you know, you know what the most deadly animal on the planet is? He goes, what's that? Spiders. We got to have a spider. <laughs> and like a few weeks later, you know, the polar bear is the most deadly animal on the planet. <laughs> we got to have polar bears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gentlemen, it's been super weird. <laughs> Dude, the scene when like Lois like is dead, you know, and he's gonna go back and turn back time, but he's just angry and he just flies like I should just be like a meme. Like, oh, the, no, 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 like 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 uh, uh, I'm remembering it mainly how I saw it as a child, but but like that was that was me seeing an adult man experience real transcendental rage and uh, like 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 he he that that was dare I say good acting on Christopher Reeve's that, part. <laughs> Shatner screaming con. Yes. Um, I believed both uh, of those moments. Oh my God. I just saw, I saw a Netflix, uh, a clip, God, a comedian. I just forget his name. He did a bit talking about how, uh, he did a whole bit about like Steven Seagal, like how Steven Seagal was like, you know, his cop show and like how he would train cops. He says, imagine you're a cop and they bring it and say, you're going to learn fighting from Steven Seagal. Oh my God. And then he, and then he says, uh, says that's like being at NASA and they say you're gonna learn you're gonna learn how to be an astronaut from you're gonna learn how to be an astronaut from Captain Kirk and William yeah. Shatner. And I'm like, what's the date? What's the date on this? Oh, this is two years ago. Yeah, dude, a year later, guess what? Joke's on you. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Captain Kirk did go to space. Space does <laughs> Oh man. This timeline is a very crazy timeline. <laughs> uh I'm gonna grab a beverage. Cool. Uh, yep, I'm gonna run to the restroom. I'm gonna oh. be here by myself. Actually, you know what? I'll I'll I'll, I'll help you. Cover. Thank you. Hey, I'll thank hang you. Out. Hey, 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 hey. Twenty minutes in. That's a pretty good. That's a spicy meatball. Uh, yeah, good stuff. The uh, so you haven't gotten any, any of the pick of destiny stuff? Uh, no. I think I just got past the part where they were talking about how funny they thought. Like, first of all, I love the fact that they try to play their very first song and then. They get so far, and he's like, "Stop! I stop. hate it. No, I hate it. It's terrible. I yeah. can't handle another second of That's it." That's <laughs> amazing that they played the first song they ever wrote, and You're it's like, like a serious, too, too sincere, too real. It's awful. Which is which is funny because it's like I do think there's a world where Jack Black is just a serious singer. Unironic. I, well, and, yeah. and they could pull it, that off, and and that that has always been the awesome sauce of Tenacious D, uh, kind of like the, uh, what I hope, uh, we're going to get out of the Disney musical, uh, Rogers, the musical is everybody's going to show up for the joke and then just have it be awesome instead. Yeah. You know, um, it's interesting. They, they, uh, they spent a lot of time talking about the pathos of pick of destiny and how proud of it they were and how devastating it was when it, when it bombed, uh, and it's one of those things where I was thinking, like, why did... I mean, like, I think it was probably just a few years too late. And also, Jack Black was, on one hand, a, a legit star. Like, he had just done King if, Kong. If that and, was their first out-of-nowhere thing, then I think it would have been much bigger. But, but Jack Black, as a known commodity who had already done School of Rock and who was in King Kong, uh, uh, upset the trajectory for, for that movie. Yeah, but at the same time, it probably wouldn't look like that, and it wouldn't probably wouldn't have the cast like that if it had been done earlier. Like right. it's because his, you know, it was it was New Line taking a gamble on like eh, I don't know Jack Black, Jack Black doing a thing like that he really really wants to do. Let's go, like like roll the dice. Here's here's ten million dollars. Uh, but I mean, because even I, I'm a huge Tenacious D fan. I didn't see it in theaters, and it's what? like yeah. Oh man! Because I was just at a different kind of phase. It was just yeah. that one of those moments where you know I was just three years out of the time where I would have crawling through broken was, glass. Was, was it around the same time that uh, uh, that the Phantom Menace came out? No, it, it was what two thousand 
No, that's right. It was later. It was like 2006 or seven. I think it might have been like eight or nine. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I do remember just being blown away. Oh, it was up against Borat. That's what it was. Oh, it I, was 06. I, it was 06. I, I couldn't understand why everyone was talking about the Borat movie when the Tenacious Steven, two properties that were nurtured in HBO's ecosystem, yeah. and, and one of them clearly better than the other, the Pick of Destiny being the winner. Uh, uh, and yet everyone was talking about Borat. And I'm like, uh, guys, did you not already see this? Uh, yeah, Borat was such a funny movie. But yeah, I, it was, I think it was just... It was just one of those things where it was it was just just a bit outside of like the perfect rhythm a bit of, of when of it phase. would have been the 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 thing. Yeah. Uh and and it did feel like like, Jack. like 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 Jack Black had just gotten so big that it was like how are we if we're rooting for Jack Black right. how do we feel about him going back and doing this and playing an underdog when we've already seen him win so hard. Yeah. 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 Uh all right here I'm going to run to the restroom. You are, uh, I am too. You uh, two talk. Yeah, you two talk. <laughs> okay. Ha ha, now you have to speak. Okay. Hey, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Bryce and Andrew Show. Welcome back, everybody. It's just us. I'm here. Bryce. I'm Andrew. This is Andrew. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hi, Andrew. Uh, Bryce, you watching Foundation at all? I uh, I watched the first I watched the first uh, three or four episodes of the first season, and... I would like to get back to it because I liked it enough, and the fact that they made a second season is a is a is, I think, a good enough sign. Are you enjoying the new season? Uh, I mean, I find it, I'm enjoying it better than I did the first. The first was a yeah. lot of just getting used to the fact of like, man, they don't like this story for the same reasons that I like this story, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, you know, as you sort of get into it being its own show, the pacing's a little, you know, but I, I you know, I'm enjoying it, you know. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I really liked, especially those first few episodes where it's really like, you know, going through time really fast. And it's, 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 it's a lot of, um, uh, kind of a lot of exposition at once. Um. But yeah, I, I, I want to give it another go. Um, I just, I, you know what it was? I think it was, I got burned by Raised by Wolves being canceled. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's made me a little gun shy on uh, science fiction. Though it, yeah, this is a I, very different thing. <laughs> I think Apple's different in that their metrics are going to be... Uh, you know, I think I'm pretty sure they're going to do another season of the show because remember, you know, App mm -hmm. Apple's in sort of different position. They like they've not renewed shows. So I think sometimes and things just have like zero numbers, mm -hmm. but you know, they are a different game. I man, um, Raised by Wolves getting canceled was sucks, and I, I get it because it just wasn't getting the momentum it had. Um, and that second season but, was bad. That second season had problem had big problems. I, I was okay with it, but I hear I like um, it. I like, I like, as soon as, the weirder that show got, the more I liked it. Um, I, you know, like, my frustration, though, is, like, with Amazon, you know, well, no peripheral, season two, but, you know, more rings of power, and, you know, there's some other stuff there. I'm like, man, I love more of this, like. Well, they can't know, get Wayne, a refund Wayne on the rings. a good show that they picked up. What's that? You know, they can't get a refund on the rings. They already wore them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was the show you said that they, they picked up? Sorry. Oh, I'm saying there was, they had a show a while back called Wayne, which was a really fun kind of like comedy drama sort of show that was originally like a YouTube show they picked up and my wife and I loved it and just didn't get any attention. But, but with the peripheral was like, man, like, yeah, that's the, the one show I really like Amazon and no, nah, we're going to, you know, Rider Shack, we're going to just put that off, but Rings of Power is coming. Yeah. Coming back. Was Wayne, was Wayne originally a YouTube? Yes. I watched. Bryce, the, I said that twice, and you just ignored me. I just, just ignored. I missed me. that part of it, but I lean out your ears, that. boy. Because I watched the first episode of this when it was on YouTube, and it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just walked in. What is it? Wayne. Nope. Fountains of Wayne. Nope. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I. It has been a long time since I even saw it to describe what it is. Um. I have I have my pick for uh, 
Raptor things. Oh, okay. Very good. It's an Apple TV show. Oh. Raptor Park. I watch more episodes. I am right. about it later. I'm having to deceive my family. I'm quietly you sneaking. Which one you up to? Just uh just just the first one. Just the first one of season two? Just just the tip. I don't believe it. Uh, I, think it... I might have watched it three times though. Oh I and it ain't to none getting Let's go. Okay, all right. All right we, we do need to address at some point Apple's plan to remove all carbon from our atmosphere. I'm a little concerned about that. I know. <laughs> all right. I'll catch you in for the after things program, Andrew, in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things show. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Bryce Castillo. Hello, hello, hello. And Justin Robert Young. What's up? <laughs> Thank you for fighting hello inflation. <laughs> it's a real problem. I know. I'm here. I'm 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 whipping too many in... syllables. Are you subtweeting <laughs> me? I am I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm whipping inflation now. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about uh, a a career change for me. Big big time big time movement. Big time. Uh, a lot uh, of folks might I... know. Uh, I'll lead you into this uh, main that you have spent uh, the last few years working with a little company called OpenAI, uh, and then the announcement last week that you are no longer with OpenAI. Can you confirm or deny this? I made the difficult decision to leave OpenAI, and yes, uh, put that on Twitter last week. Uh, and it is, and let me be clear, it has been a great company. It's been a great experience. It's not like anything. I, I've had, <laughs> fun thing, journalists follow people on Twitter. And when there are big changes with big companies, they reach out to you to ask you stuff. Oh, and it's man. like, here's my story. It's an amazing, awesome company filled with people I'm still friends with. And I've had an incredible journey there. I came there uh, back in 2020 because I wanted to do a startup, but then it would be fun to work with them. Stayed around for a year and a half, then decided to go do a startup, and then you know had a great conversation with Sam and some people there, and said, you know, let's stick around. Stuck around another year, and another year, and then I reached two years, and I said, I gotta go do my startup now while I still have a chance. So uh, while you know, before AI gets rid of you know uh, capitalism, so I decided to go to a startup. That was the the the, the, the simple answer. Uh, is it? Um, how, how much options. are uh, do you feel comfortable sharing with? Uh, us about the nature of the startup or is it something that you want to hold on to for a proper release i mean my website's up and everything's out there so it's it's all out there now uh if you go to interventional.ai um basically the startup is right now i think we're at an important point in history where ai technologies are incredibly capable but the average person trying to adopt these things. There's not enough information or ability to do that. And so what I want to do is basically create a system and platform to make it very easy for people to learn how to integrate this stuff. And I'm starting with chat GPT is an incredibly powerful tool. And so the, the startup is basically, if you've got a business and you want to train your employees on how to use chat GPT and build customized prompts and whatnot for it, interdimensional can help. So that's it. So, so uh, uh, what do you know about it? What makes you such an expert? <laughs> he, 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 uh, we all know. We all know he knows. What? No, I know. Uh, I wasn't like actually challenging him. I was pimping him. To yeah, talk. Andrew, show yeah. your bona fides. But, but, no, but 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 also we also know that Andrew is is kind and humble and and doesn't want to. Yeah, but he's a, he has a startup. <laughs> he needs to sell it. Uh, I mean. You know, part of it, and I think we've talked about this before. As far as I know, I was the first person ever hired as a prompt engineer. I was the first, and a prompt engineering existed before me, like, very clear. You know, researchers building these models and doing that, but I was the first hire for somebody to go, wow, like, you uh, you obsess over these models a lot. You you spend an unhealthy amount of time trying to get them to do stuff. Um, do you want a job? And so that was sort of kind of my, my professional career started as a, a OG prompt engineer at OpenAI. And doing that, you know, just spending a lot of time figuring out what you can do with these things. And, you know, I'm proud of a lot of things I got to do. You know, I'm in the GPT-4 paper as one of the people listed for novel model capability discovery. Mm -hmm. And that's been a thing I continue to love to do is to figure out what can you get it to do. And, and now, you know, I want to just take that and interface that with 
somebody who's got a job to do, you know, and from whether you're somebody working in finance or HR, or maybe you're working at a research lab and you're like, well, can this accelerate what I'm trying to do? I want to go in and have my company help people figure out, yes, this is how we can use AI to accelerate what you're doing. Yeah. And I think that that's really the knowledge gap that you are very, very uniquely positioned to bridge for people is compared to a year ago. And for the, for the record, let's also remind everybody that ChatGPT has existed for less than a year. So uh, 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 it, is, it has been as influential as it has been uh, in, in our world in less than 12 months. People know more about what it can do or what it can do for them, but we are still at very basic levels of, of understanding of what these models are and exactly how you can really, really, really rev them up. And that's something that you have spent the last several years digging into the guts on and, and, and working on stuff as it's been uh, uh, developed. I, I don't know if anybody on the planet has the knowledge base that you have, not only of the, the, the tech, but also understanding the 360 of entrepreneurship and business and, and the workflow side of it. Well, and uh, if, if, if I could double down and feel free to let me know what parts you disagree with. Um, uh, number one, anybody who goes fully independent and let's say becomes a cruise ship magician and then decides to start writing books, developing new magic routines, and then decides to start cracking the dynamic of what it takes to write the perfect techno thriller, that's somebody who understands systems and also understands the way to do very effective communication. And then up comes large language models, which is where we're at with AI, that are built on effective communication. So uh, somebody who taught themselves how to program and how to build apps and also speaks the languages of how to exquisitely communicate to other humans uh, and also had a front row seat to the last three years of the development of everything, I would say is uniquely positioned to help anybody to usher into this new age in which, yes, you need to write programs, but you don't need to even understand how Python works as long as you can speak the language of humans, which uh, you are exceptionally good and proven at doing. Does, does, does most of what I say ring true? I sort of flattered and hope to live up to it. I, I think a lot of it comes back down to, too, is that you know, years ago, you know, we we were all involved in the skeptic movement, right? We're all involved in the skeptic movement. And, you know, Brian performed, performed about this. And Justin and I worked for the James Randi Foundation. And, you know, it comes down to sort of critical thinking and it's understanding information. And I think that when it comes to being really good now, the AI systems, particularly large language models, critical thinking is an important tool because critical thinking means understanding what a thing does, what it can do, what it can't do, figuring out why it didn't do the thing you did, you wanted to do. And I think that's kind of the core here where I, that's the thing that I always sort of look at is like, I always be like, why am I wrong? Why, what, what were my assumptions wrong about this? And then why did it not do the thing that I thought it would do? And um, now, you know, you apply that forward as we have, instead of trying to figure out how do you navigate the world of information and other people, how do you navigate the world of these huge language models and their capabilities? And it still takes, it all comes down to like uh, an appreciation for critical thinking. Um, Somebody pointed out, I imagine someone looking into business with Andrew and searching his name, and the first result is it's cut off here, but I can guess what that would be. Don't trust Andrew Main. That's right. Um, <laughs> that that was when I was named the the science communicator open AI. I'm like, I like joke, like, all right, just so you know, when journalists go Google, who's the guy who's the communicating the science for open yeah. AI? And it's <laughs> don't trust Andrew Main. Well, and uh if, if a mischief loving if, magician, nah, he's gonna give you the straight shot. If 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 you want to do a judo flip on that, uh in order to deceive somebody, you have to create a model of what they expect to see, and you have to be able to communicate the truth effectively so that you can subtly tell something close to the truth to position them to have that moment of amazement. So uh, I, I, I don't think that's as big of a hurdle as, as, as uh, one might yeah. think. I mean, I, I look back at, you know, we've all been involved in the creation of magic tricks, right? And creating a magic trick and then teaching somebody to it involves going from your understanding of what the end effect is and all the steps it takes you to get there. And then realizing how do you translate that to another person? And I think a lot of like teaching people how to prompt or how to use AI is the same thing because you just sort of 
I watch people, you know, I asked you to type a letter and it, it got it all wrong. Like, well, did you tell who it was to? Well, no. Did you tell it was about? No. Did you tell how long it was about? Like, those things seem obvious to me, but somebody looking at the system might assume that maybe it has that information because somehow tied into your Gmail or something. And you have to sort of step back. And I think that is all of us have been involved in teaching from a lot of point. It comes from trying to understand who's the person learning. And, and I use my model a lot, me earlier along the path. And I yeah. got my job and, in part because I had to explain the stuff to myself yeah. all the time. Yeah. And, and I think you're really uniquely positioned because of that, you know, we LLMs and, and these AI models are only going to become more integrated into the way that we do things. Uh, uh, a very short example, uh, I, I saw a clip of a teacher talking online about how do you use, uh, uh, how do you build a lesson plan where students can't cheat with a chat GPT or an AI device? And the teacher said, well, have them use the AI, have it write your essay for you and then bring it in and edit it and make it good <laughs> at school so that you have the help and guidance. Like, like there's, there are going to be a lot of, of, of really either hybrid or integrations of, of AI, just in the same way that we have calculators integrated into human uh, uh, life and education. Well, and, and, and this is just, uh, it's going to grow more and more. I, 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 what it makes me think of is the, the phrase show your work is just going to mean something different. It used to be show your work meant that you make notation of how you got the answer of, yeah. you know, whatever this division thing is, but now show your work could quite simply be hit record on your screen and let me watch the process you went through using an AI, asking the right questions, doing the research, and ending up with this excellent essay. Like, that also is showing your work. <laughs> it's funny. I, I was working with OpenAI to do uh, research into education. Talked to a lot of teachers. And uh, one, of the, the, one of the things that I found almost universally was that all the teachers that I talked to were not worried about cheating in the way that uh, we have kind of heard the the conversation around that and one of them was like yeah uh all of my students do all of their uh all of their their assignments in google docs mm. and i have revision history right ah, yeah. so i know if 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 they are actually if, typing if something, or suddenly a giant leap a gigantic happens. block yeah. of text uh uh shows up yeah but you know the 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 evolution of education when it comes to to, to ChatGPT is fascinating, and and a lot of the conversation around it from the educators were this the the time that a teacher spends with students might change a lot. That what you what you want is creation to happen in the classroom as opposed to happening outside of the classroom, because right. the basics of creation are that it takes time. It, it's going to take you a while to write a five page essay. It's going to take you a while to read X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that will always do that. But at the point of creation, normally you wouldn't waste time saying, Hey, everybody do your assignment while the teacher's here. But that might be more valuable in a world where things can happen very, very quickly and uh, uh, research and ideas and everything that what you, what you want is the teacher there to help, shape what Andrew's talking about, which is how do you get the most out of this idea? Where is there a disconnect between using this tool uh, to get everything that you want out of it, which is, by the way, a lot more exciting and enriching than just asking it to do a thing where, where you don't know whether or not that's that's the idea. Because yeah. uh, the, the whole thing, to, to put a last point for for the the grade school uh, and uh, parallels here like the whole point there is you want these kids to learn <laughs> to learn the material and know it and making them uh, you know making them learn how to write a paper is valuable um, but at the end of the day you want them to know what happened in the wars and what the math does and yeah if maybe that used to mean repetition maybe it means learning how to talk to the AI because if you tell the AI to write, if you if you have to give the AI enough instruction, uh, you're still just writing, right? What if there was an educational yeah. version of an AI where you had to put the facts in, but it still wrote everything for you, or something like that? Yeah, I think 
people are teachers are adapting very quickly as we've seen and, and there's some the ones that i've seen kind of complain the loudest tend to be kind of the academics who don't spend as much time in the classroom the ones that tend to spend a lot of time in the classroom like they're they get it they like it they're using it they're embracing it they work around it and they're like ah oh, it's going to help people cheat like so does a parent doing a kid's homework you know yeah. my argument is it's, it's almost becomes this sort of classist argument where the kid who has the parent that's willing to take the time to help them that's fine but you know, some other kid who doesn't have the opportunity that's using this, that that's bad and it's silly. And I, I think, you know, there is you know, AI is scary. It is is an existential potential existential threat. There there is a lot of that, but it is there are degrees of AI. There's ways in which you can use it and the amount. And to me it's kind of like debating, well, should we use math or not? You know, should, yeah. should we use math? I don't know. I'm not sure about math. And I think whenever I hear people like, oh, I'm worried about AI, it's like, say you're worried about math. Then, then tell me where you're worried about it. Here, I think that an example I've given before, and, and you know, anybody knows me, is that when I worked on the Shark Week special, I did, did a special for Shark Week, as you don't know. And I visited a lab, a big, one of the best marine biology research labs, oceanographic research labs in the world. And this thing is like, Looks like something out of a movie set. They had a dock with power boats. They had ocean views. They had a wave tank the size of a racquetball court. It just was an amazing facility, extremely well funded, and had the brightest people in the world. People, anybody who, you know, super bright, wanted to work with dolphins or something like that, you would go there. I'm walking down the hallway on a tour, and I look through a door, and I see a woman, a young woman, in front of a TV set playing a video of underwater video of fish swimming by a reef and she's got a clicker in one hand and a clipboard in her other and i go what are you doing she goes oh i'm counting clownfish and every time a clownfish swam by she'd click it and write down the time stamp that the clownfish swam by and i'd been in the middle of working on my shark week technology i was building a system to let me see 360 around me and i was using imagery recognition systems and stuff and sort of a lot of it's still sort of new to me but i'm like excited about it i go well why don't you use OpenCV and train a model to do clownfish recognition? And then you could do a baseline for like eight hours and take five random spots or whatever and count how many fish and see how accurate it is. And OpenCV is this Python library that makes it super easy to train models. You can just, anybody listening to me right now, in a few hours, you, a weekend project, you could build the thing I just described. I know it sounds super complicated, but there's tutorials, instructions out there. It's actually not as hard. You just need to get some images, follow some instructions, whatever. And I said, well, you can do this because it's like, it will be a weekend project. And this person's like, what's OpenCV? And I didn't know what it was a year before. But to me, it's like, oh, of course, everybody should know this now. And this person didn't know Python because, I don't know, they're like one of the smartest people on the planet about fish. Yeah. I knew nothing about clownfish. And and I had this realization. It's a snake. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm like, this, this is this person's job, this task, they could free up hundreds of hours over the course of the year if they had somebody had to walk them through a three-hour course and to do this sort of thing but there was nobody there to do that there wasn't a point at which they could stop and do that and there was no thing but and then and the thing the deeper hold on a second, right, the deeper realization hit me was somewhere there's somebody in a cancer research laboratory yeah. looking at cells or looking at stuff like that and hundreds of hours thousands of hours could be saved in their lives and that's the thing was like i was like oh shoot this gap is scary. Yeah. Well, and uh, if, if, if I'm reading between the lines correctly, the gift that you are hoping to give to the world is to educate uh, people effectively about how uh, many of us naturally see the problem. And then the moment we encounter a way to fix the problem, we stop asking questions. Whereas AIs will not stop asking questions. For example, in the case of task, count clownfish. Well, I guess turn on the thing grab a clicker. I'm doing it. Uh, clearly I'm doing the job, but, uh, but with a little bit more effort and the right prompts, you could say, hello, I have a job and it is to find out how many clownfish there are over 75 hours of footage of this video. What are many different ways I could do this? And then you see a list. Uh, one would of course be to sit and watch and click, but another one might be write a script in this language. You're like, and then you could say, I'm unfamiliar with this language. Is it easy to do? Is it hard to do? And I was like, yes, uh, it's very easy to do. You just need this library, this thing. And it's like, okay, well now what do I do? It's like, well here, I will write you some code for it. Uh, try an example, uh, test it uh, on, on this thing. And, and within three hours, you now have a fully automated script to replace 
those days and days of, of effort that would have otherwise been wasted. If, if uh, w- would that be a, an accurate way of, of summing up one of the gifts that, that you hope to offer? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, yeah, I think you took it a step forward to the point that, that, uh, that we, when I worked in GPT-3, I was tempted to go off and do stuff. And I thought GPT-3 was pretty capable, but once we got to GPT-4, and remember, you know, being open AI, I got to play with this thing since last year. And I yeah. looked at just how powerful this was and to see what it does and the ability for it to continue on and keep trying to solve a task. If you say, try this, no, try it again, try it again. And the scenario you just described is it's, it's absolutely 100% true. And it feels like science fiction. You could now sit down with this system. And there are other systems out there, but I'm a big fan of ChatGPT, so I'm going to push that. You could sit down and have that experience you just described. Like, I have to do this task. How can I automate this? What can I do? Walk with, and it will take you through all those steps. And like, yeah, and a few hours later, you will have that. It can help you write, you know, a what's called a Python notebook. It could tell you where to do it. And you could do all of this, but you got to ask the question, you right. know, and, and you, and you got to know what the capability is. And that's, that's, that's the big, the big gap right now. And I've worked with people in, you know, in, at open AI, I've been working with people for several years now across different industries and stuff. And, you know, and sometimes we're like, yeah, we have to do this thing, and we're looking to go hire these people to do this. I'm like, oh, that's just three sentences. Yeah. And then they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, because you just need to do this and do that. And once it does that, you're set up. And I've had many times I've worked with big tech companies and shown them, no, ask this question. Now you have this. And just save them you know, huge amounts of money because all of a sudden they realize, okay, uh, and it just, it's just part of it. Yeah, Brian, it is teaching people is one is just sort of help people create, like part of the way this works is basically go in and help somebody in a role say, this is, these are the prompts you can use, whatever. The other part is to say, let me teach you how to ask the question. So any problem you have that could, and not every problem is solvable by AI right now. Like, that's the thing too, is you don't want to go down a rabbit hole and find out like, nope, can't be done, but you can get a pretty good, you know, pretty good insight early on with a little bit of information. Well, and uh, one of the wonderful things about the large language models is the fact that um, uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, all of the information was created by other humans. So really what you're teaching, uh, the, the quiet part loud is you're teaching people how to effectively communicate to all of humanity that came before <laughs> you and say, uh, this is my end goal. Tell me this and then and, and how to do this. And then comes up with ideas. You're like, tell me more about blank. And then, and I, I, I don't know. It's uh, uh, one of the most amazing experiences I've had with uh, open AI was learning to program simply by asking for incremental things and watching it do it and understanding the structure of it. And uh, uh, that is a, a wonderful skill that I, I truly do believe you are uniquely qualified to to bring to the rest of the planet. Well, I, I mean, the more people that are out there doing what I want to do, the better. I'm like, I'm actually working on a blog post because I want to talk about like like this is a space I want to get into. And the more people who I, I know, there's a lot of really clever people in AI who are doing some like you know cool stuff. And I'm like, there's there's that building stuff is cool, but my God. Teaching people how to use the tools we have can cause so much positive acceleration. So I want to encourage other people to consider doing the same thing. Um, I'll say this though: I mean, like it's it's you're at a point now where people will use GPT four to create new data. Yeah, you know, they'll say like, mm-hmm. "Hey, you know, let me write some code. Write it. Solve this differently. Solve this differently." And then you create entirely new bits of data. You can go back, and now you can cha- you can train. The GPT 3.5, and the GPT 3.5 is a highly capable model. So we're in this sort of phase where the computers are going to start teaching themselves. Yeah, and I I read a news article that said as much was ha- is happening right now. Uh, when that's that's a tough that might be a tough thing a, a data entropy of the link models training models training models and then what uh, what what happens then? Do you do you does that hyper contrast the the language that these models use or or did they get stuck in time that would be well there there remember that think about it this way there's there's two kinds of intelligence right we, we use with the people we talk about there's crystalline and there's fluid crystalline is the facts you have fluid is your problem solving capability okay benjamin franklin sadly has very little crystalline knowledge of the 20th or the 21st century. Should we bring them forward in time and we say, all right, Benjamin Franklin, who was elected president in 1960? Not going to know. It's going to seem kind of dumb. 
Yeah. And you're going to go, okay, is Benjamin Franklin dumb? Like, no, actually give him a set of encyclopedias, you know, give him some puzzles and give him the elements to solve. His fluid intelligence extremely high. He can put these pod parts together. And with AI models, their fluid intelligence keeps increasing. A lot of people get fixated on the, the crystalline. Well, does it know this fact about here? Well, there's, you know, an example I've given in a post I talked about before is I could feed a model nothing but like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter or fantasy fiction and stuff. And it's not going to know much about our world, but it's going to know about taxonomies. It'll know that, you know, Harry Potter is in the Gryffindor house, which is part of Hogwarts, which is part of this larger school system of schools, which is part of the wizarding world. And you can learn, and just the same as, you know, hey, a bat is a mammal, which is part of a carnata, which is, you know, man, you know, you know, animals, whatever. And so that's the thing is you realize that, like, these systems, as that fluid knowledge gets more and more powerful, it's problem-solving capabilities. And that was really what was great about GPT-4. It wasn't just the stuff that it remembered. It's when you said, hey, this is broken. Fix it. Yeah. And that's what's spooky, you know? Yeah. Well, what's not spooky is your future with interdimensional AI. That's right. Uh, uh, we are very, very excited about what comes next. It's going to be big. It's uh, going to be interdimensionally it's, big. It's, it's, it's going to be uh, 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 difficult for me to remember which parts I am and am not allowed to speak about publicly because I really just want to talk to you about your, your business. Just stop. <laughs> Stop telling Brian things. Uh, damn it. That, <laughs> unfortunately, we're now, we're that's, now in that the realm the where you need to stop talking to Brian uh, about oh, things. Hey, I just want to help. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, my pick's going to be interdimensional.ai. Hey! I think they're a new business consulting business about open AI, GTB. Sure, it's not Taskmaster. <laughs> I've been hearing things. Been hearing things about Taskmaster. Uh, so are, are, are you starting with a, uh, a email? list uh i probably should um you just got a contact, contact form button. yeah mm. get that list you gotta get you know you well, gotta get the a problem list is price i have i have to decide like what what did i want my call to action to be there you mm. know somebody who says hey uh i'm a company we're trying to solve this problem versus i want to subscribe to your email list i'm not saying you're wrong i was just no. sort of i went through that if yeah. i can ask them to do one thing yeah yeah it's uh... and that'll be some, and I think that'll be a good after things topic in the future in terms of how you set your call to actions based on the, the target funnel. audience. The and the, yeah. Um, Stay tuned to the after things podcast, everybody. You know you love it. My pick is the after party. <laughs> oh. So the after party is a show on Apple TV, and it's in its second season, hmm. and I'm watching it, and I gotta say, the the, the, the premise of the show is that each uh, uh, there's a murder. Everybody is telling the same story of what happened leading in the events leading up to the murder. And in the first season, there was uh, uh, the idea was each person's memory was a different genre of a uh, uh, movie. Yeah. This one, they dig a little bit deeper what? and it is specific directors that they are doing parodies of at least the two that i watched last night one of them was a very steven soderbergh-esque heist uh a uh, kind of uh, uh direction and the other which is my favorite this season is a full wes anderson parody <gasps> it's all beautiful and twee and and it's, pastel it's down to the claymation. Oh, uh, 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 oh! It's going to be even harder for me to pretend to my family like I haven't already watched it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really really good. The the narration, the acting, the way the the, the affected acting, the uh, the sets, uh, uh, just great. Uh, uh, this this has been a, a very very fun season, and uh, I I've, I've I've been enjoying it. It's good. I know. That's the first I've heard about it. I have to check that out. <laughs> how, how, how much longer until we get you to Crater and watch all of them? Have you watched all of them? Uh, n no, I just, I, I haven't yet. I don't know. I, get, I keep getting distracted by YouTube videos of body cam footage. <laughs>
everything okay? That lady is, is everything okay? That lady got drunk and is, then yelled at the cop, man. Is everything okay? Whenever Bryce Whenever Bryce tells me about how much body cam footage she's watching, oh I just God. I just feel like it's 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 time oh. for a mental health check in. <laughs> oh man. Andrew, do you got a pick? I have no pick today. I'm trying to build a business, Bryce. You think I, I can sit around just watching stuff? I guess you could pick your business. You but... did watch like three Superman movies. <laughs> I mean, that's that's called research. One and a quarter, Justin, and okay. over a period of a week. <laughs> uh, I, I will say uh, uh, I've always been fascinated because I, I have an inability to distract myself with almost anything when I need to get something done. I need to just, just sit there and bang my head against the wall until it's finished. Uh, 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 we, uh, uh, Andrew and I got you beat on that one. <laughs> Andrew has always been able to to compartmentalize uh, and, and healthily, I think, give his know when his brain needs some kind of break and uh, 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 will will enjoy a, a, a movie or two. I've always I've always been very jealous of Andrew's brain like that. I mean, it's mostly at like night watching. Although uh, <laughs> I had bad allergies last night because right, congested, so I took a bunch of decongestant. I took a to over de- overdosed on Sudafed. Woke up at like four a.m. and watched the Joker. Oh, so good, you, that that was so dangerous. good. You were you were about to get the cops called on. I you. know Joker fight over here. <laughs> Joker pilled. Yeah, uh, yeah. I uh, that was a. Uh, was one of those things where I congested and two hours later, like still bad. I'm like, I just did not want to go. She said, I took two more Sudafed. And then I'm like, went to sleep, then woke right up <laughs> and couldn't sleep. So I'm congested. Uh, the, you're laughing and I'm congested. All the way through like that <laughs> it's, forever, it's like so. uh, uh, <laughs> your wife comes in, and you just hand her a card that says, I'm sorry, I am on Sudafed watching the Joker right now. I have a I condition that, that causes me to continue to watch this all morning. That is my pick. Such a good movie. It Such really is. Joke. Uh, yeah, and the sequel, a musical, huh? Joker two. Is is yeah, it a full I... musical? And that's uh, well, yeah, it, it has been referred to as a musical. Oh, that was a good thing they got Lady Gaga then. Yeah, I think that's probably what I'm nervous. Cast it. Yeah, you're nervous? I'm nervous. Why nervous? Well, uh, uh because. Part of, if if I may guess, Andrew, uh, uh, the reason I'm nervous is because Joker is an excellent anti-hero story. Where at no point are we confused into the Joker being a good guy at all. Um, he is a broken human who is broken, and but, and for such but, should be but prison. The, the introduction of 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 uh, what's her name uh, will Harley Quinn. Uh, uh, might tempt us to recast him as some kind of anti-hero and i i don't know how i feel yeah. about that either yeah because i because like i what i liked about when joker came out everybody wanted to politicize it right where there was that that of ah know, yes legions of and, young men that have been disaffected it's the incel anthem and you watch it and you're like, well, it could be a thing about being blue collar too, at this and that. You could read a lot into it, but you look at his journey as, man, we need to do more to help the mental health of people. Yes. This is about a guy that just got, you know, a physically abused when he was a child. There's a subtext in there about concussions to the head, possibly cause some sort of lasting damage in him. And he keeps getting pushed aside and pushed aside and ignored and ignored. The boy says, he's like, he says, I didn't even know if I was real. And you're like, what a weird thing to say. But like, no, this is, that's, like, man, this is like the – forget One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which I think the next one's actually going to kind of emulate a bit. But I mean, this is a great commentary about mental health. Yeah. Like, how do you get to this horrible spot with the city rioting and things like this and guys like this being held up as heroes? Because just – like, I'm just like, man, this is a really good commentary. We need to look after each other. And this time with songs. <laughs> Three, two, one. Three, two, one. We'll see. Yeah. Give it a well, though, it's it's crazy, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, two, five, nine. Oh, getting math rocky. It's been after. <laughs> All righty, everybody. That'll do it for the program today. Woo-woo. Thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna... Brian, you've been watching Strange New Worlds? Uh, no, but it is on my list of, of permittable uh, 
uh, indulgences. Uh, I the one episode that I watched that was the lower decks episode I liked a lot, and I liked what I saw uh, from the musical one. Yeah, it it looks like what if Star Trek was fun? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I watched a promo for the other show, and it was just like, oh, we're breaking boundaries, doing this, 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 and this. It's like, man, like you still think you were. Yeah, you still think you were, you know, mm. talking about topics that Star Trek hasn't been talking about for 50 years. You know, like, I guess you never watched Star Trek. Mm. Yeah, uh, I did. Uh, uh, I did go back and watch the Next Generation episode of uh, Darmok. Um, there's an eight minute cut that it's the whole episode without any of the. Oh, we're worried about fighting the alien stuff. And it's just the important parts. Uh, uh, watch the eight minute cut of Darmok on 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 YouTube. Is Darmok the one where they had the weird language? Yeah, or? yeah, uh, that language yeah. that spoke only in metaphors and memes, and uh, which, uh, yeah, and that's funny because they have a character. You know, the, there's the character in Lower Decks who does that, and every now and then somebody will make a Dharma like say a thing like that to him. You're like, oh, very good, you know. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> they're all like uh, uh, Picard, his joy un untethered. <laughs> yeah. yeah, ultimate meme language. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks, we're going to go offline. All right, bye, Develop guys. Our own See ya. Have a good yeah. rest of your weekend. Bye.